So today's presentation will be given by the wonderful Catherine Mason, Assistant Professor of Anthropology, Brown University. Dr. Mason is a medical anthropologist who has conducted ethnographic fieldwork in China and the United States. Her research addresses issues in medical anthropology, population health, global health, bioethics, China studies, reproductive health, and mental health. Her first book, Infectious Change, Re Reinventing Chinese Public Health After an Epidemic, based on fieldwork she conducted in southeastern China on the professionalization eth and ethics of public health in China following the 2003 SARS epidemic. Um, the book was published by Stanford University Press in 2016. She's currently working on a multi-sided ethnographic field project that examines family experiences of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders in the United States and China. She's also a core consultant on the American's conception of health equity studies, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Dr. Mason is affiliated with Brown's Population Studies and Training Center and the program in Science and Technology Studies, and she has served as an advisor in the Engaged Scholars Program. Her research has been funded by the Social Science Research Council, Wintergreen Foundation, Robert Wood Jan Johnson Foundation, uh, U.S. Fulbright Program, and the Association for Asian Studies. She has previ previously held positions as a Robert Wood Jan Johnson Foundation Health and Society Scholar. And a lecturer in the Health and Societies Program at the University of Pennsylvania. She received her PhD in social anthropology from Harvard University in 2011. Today, uh, Dr. Mason will be speaking on who is the common in the common good, public health, global health, and the bifurcation of service and governance in urban China. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Zhu Ying, for that really nice introduction. Also to Ina, I want to thank for uh, organizing my visit. And I'm, I'm really glad to be here today and look forward to your questions and comments. So anthropologists like to tell stories. Um, uh, that's kind of what we do. So I'm going to start today with a story. So nearly 15 years ago, in April 2003, I was evacuated from my post teaching English in Guangzhou, which in case there are any non-China experts in the room, is a large city in southeastern China in a region called the Pearl River Delta. It was the height of China's outbreak of SARS, or severe acute respiratory syndrome. SARS is a novel flu-like virus thought to derive from live animals sold in Chinese wet markets, and it first appeared in the Pearl River Delta in late 2002. At the time, and this was before becoming an anthropologist was really on my radar, I was a recently lapsed molecular biology major who had been trained as an undergraduate in what the anthropologist in me would now call a reductionist tradition, meaning that from my perspective at the time, there was nothing culturally situated about disease. Viruses attack cells, which causes biological disease, which should be treated with medication or rest, and that was kind of the end of the story. So I was perplexed in the early spring of 2003 by how a virus that seemed so thoroughly unimpressive to my friends and colleagues in Guangzhou, which competed with scores of other microbes to cause disease in a tiny minority of Guangzhou's millions of citizens, had nevertheless spurred enough panic back home for my sponsoring American program to demand my involuntary evacuation back to the US. So there I am being evacuated. And it also spurred enough panic among my own family members that, convinced I was going to be patient zero for an American outbreak of SARS, they attempted upon my return to involuntarily quarantine me in my sister's apartment in Philadelphia for 10 days with only a bag of groceries and a DVD player to keep me company. And keep in mind, this was before Netflix or streaming, so this was a really grim situation. Now, there's qu nothing quite like being imprisoned by your own family to leave you with something to chew on. And so, of course, I did the logical thing that any reasonable person would do in this situation and decided to go to graduate school and spend the better part of the next decade trying to figure out what all this meant. So before I get into what I now, many years later, think it all meant, let me review briefly what SARS was. In Guangzhou, we started hearing about a strange new virus around the end of 2002, but no one paid much attention until February 2003 when a physician crossed into nearby Hong Kong and spread the SARS virus to over a dozen hotel guests who then carried it around the world. In an unprecedented move, the World Health Organization then issued a global health alert and urged the cessation of all non-urgent travel to mainland China and Hong Kong, and later to other cities. SARS went on to kill about 800 people worldwide and sicken about 8,000. After initially denying the scope of SARS within China, the central Chinese government finally admitted error following a whistleblower's report. 
Chinese leaders purged the Minister of Health and the mayor of Beijing, promised to cooperate with all international disease control efforts, and began aggressively instituting control measures. This included quarantining entire hospitals, city blocks, universities, and villages, and setting up neighborhood watch systems to root out potential carriers of disease. The WHO, the World Health Organization, praised China's actions and credited them in part with the success of the global containment effort. Some scholars have since argued that China's political system has the rare powers necessary to control a novel epidemic. For example, Joan Kaufman wrote in 2006, quote, in China, where individual civil liberties are rarely prioritized over issues of public safety or order, the government apparatus was able to detain and isolate citizens even when they had no direct exposure to a confirmed SARS patient. She goes on to argue that this ability to mobilize quickly and aggressively was, quote, precisely what was required to put in place the series of preventive measures that broke the chain of transmission. Reactions like this left me feeling uneasy, though. What did it mean exactly for American scholars to be pointing to the lack of civil liberties in China as a useful disease control tool? And what lessons had really been learned? So these questions led me back to China to conduct an ethnographic field project on the development of public health after SARS, and eventually to the publication of my book, Infectious Change. Rather than just tell the story of how epidemics play out differently in different locales, when I set out to write this book, I wanted to understand what kind of meaning those who were tasked with trying to stop epidemics like SARS were in turn searching for themselves. So I set out to live with, eat with, drink with, drink a lot more with, and go through the daily lives of a bunch of local bureaucrats who worked in a collection of city, district, and street-level public health institutions in a city that I call Tian Mai. And I should pause here to note that that's a pseudonym and that those who are familiar with China, so that's a lot of people here, uh, are probably gonna have no trouble figuring out what city I'm talking about, but I'm gonna use a pseudonym anyway. I've used it in my book, and if you have questions about that, I'm happy to discuss later. So by the time I began my field work in 2008, Tian Mai, which is located near Guangzhou in the Pearl River Delta, had grown from a rural outpost 30 years prior into a city of 14 million people, and it now has more like 20 million. Because the vast majority of this population was made up of people who had migrated here from other parts of China, local residents dubbed Tian Mai China's city of immigrants. I spent a year at Tian Mai Center for Disease Control and Prevention in 2008 and 2009 as a participant observer, with shorter follow-up trips in 2010 and 2014. I participated in daily activities and research projects and also conducted interviews with approximately 100 public health bureaucrats at the CDC and over a dozen related institutions in Tian Mai as well as in Guangzhou, Hong Kong, and Beijing. My interlocutors were, on the surface, not very noble people. These were folks who forced healthy people into quarantine. They kept life-saving drugs from HIV-positive migrants under the premise that the migrants should go back home if they want treatment. They used public money to get drunk and eat fine foods. As I'll describe later in the talk, they also falsified health data and forged signatures on informed consent forms. So in other words, these are folks who might not seem on the surface to be doing what many of us think those who work in public health should be doing, that is, serving the common good. And yet what I learned, and what I really want to focus on in my talk today, is that that is exactly what they did think that they were doing. It's just that the common index by common good that they were striving to serve did not always or even often overlap with the population of their city. So I want to dig a little deeper into this point. The legal scholar Lawrence Gossin notes that the aggregate nature of the public health client makes it difficult to pin down to whom public health professionals have a responsibility. And I just want to quote Gossin here. He says, to whom do public health professionals owe a duty of loyalty, and how can these professionals know what actions are morally acceptable? Physicians, attorneys, and accountants have a fiduciary duty to their clients and informs their moral world. In the context of public health, the community might be regarded as the client. The problem is it is unclear what constitutes a community. The notion is often vague and fragmented. One reason this is difficult is that the slippery edges of what might be considered a community open the door for public health professionals to be able to leave out from that category those whom they felt they could not or should not let in. My interlocutor's commitment to serving the group and not the individual allowed for a slippage that left out from that group most of the individuals who actually lived in Tian Mai. Finally, in China, as in many other places, most of the institutions where public health professionals worked were arms of the state. Clinicians who work for public hospitals in China also work for the state, but because clinicians are charged with healing tangible individuals, a clear dyadic relationship establishes unity between the client being targeted and the client being served. Although physicians in China certainly have been known to violate the ethical norms of the clinical relationship, those norms do establish clear expectations. 
A physician may work for the state, but her primary professional responsibility should be to the patient being treated. A doctor who treats a patient's illness is at least supposed to be doing so for the benefit of that same patient. But in abstracting the patient to the group, the relationship is no longer dyadic and the identity of the service recipient no longer clear. A local public health professional has a responsibility to guard the interests of the state by governing local populations that may spread diseases. Thus, he or she is always in some sense serving the state. But his or her object of professional service, the client group that the public health professional considers to be his or her patient, can vary, and the recipients of any benefits produced through the governance of infections may not be the same as the participants in the governance exercise itself. For example, state public health officials might quarantine a plane load of people exposed to a virus in the interest of protecting those already on the ground. In this case, the patient who is treated is not the same as the patient who receives the benefit of that treatment. The group being served is not the group being governed. This is what I refer to in my book as the bifurcation of service and governance. And in some cases, this type of bifurcation might be necessary and good, but when the group that is being governed systematically and repeatedly differs from the one that is being served, then certain dangers emerge. In the case of Tian Mai, in working to serve the common good, public health professionals engaged in a slippage that left out from the common most of the inhabitants of their city. The population of Tian Mai was overwhelmingly made up of people who had migrated from other parts of China, and the overwhelming majority of this overwhelming majority consisted of rural to urban migrant workers, or the floating population. And given this audience, I'm not going to spend the time that I normally do in talks explaining who the floating population is and why it's important, because I'm sure most of you already know this, but suffice to say that since the 1980s, hundreds of millions of Chinese have moved from rural to urban settings in one of the largest migrations in human history. And tens of millions of these ended up in the urban Pearl River Delta. The Hukou residence system prevented a large proportion of them from settling down permanently or obtaining public services. Because most public health professionals in Tian Mai had themselves migrated to the city, many of them from the same rural areas as the floating population, they went to great pains to draw sharp contrasts between white collar workers like themselves and the migrant workers with whom they did not want to be associated. In my book, I discuss at length how the supposed filth of the floating population was used in public health settings in Tian Mai to build boundaries between good and bad migrants. One public health professional in her late 30s, for example, told me of her time working on a migrant exam team. This team conducted the annual physicals that the floating population had to undergo in order to work in eating or entertainment establishments. The exams represented the only contact that most migrants had with the urban health system. This public health worker said, quote, it was so hot and stuffy that I felt like I was going to die, and all the workers were dirty and all sweaty. There was so much sweat, and their skin had all these problems. You had to touch them to do the exam. It was disgusting. It felt very unsafe there. I couldn't take it. I got myself transferred as soon as I could. My interlocutors complained that migrants had poor sanitary habits, poor immune systems, and irresponsible risk behaviors all of which made them more likely to spread infectious disease to the more civilized members of society. They then felt it was their duty to manage this public health threat carefully in order to prevent or contain epidemics like SARS and in turn to serve the common good. But who then was to be served as part of this common good? This was a complicated question, not least because of the radical changes in people's understandings of the common good that had come about in the past half century or so. So in the 1930s and 40s, the Chinese sociologist Fei Xiaotong noted that a person's community could expand and contract based on the particularities of the relationships of the people involved. He compared this to circles that appear on the surface of a lake when a rock is thrown in it, with each rock corresponding to an ego. In Fei's China, there was no common good. Each ego's universe was composed of his or her own network of relationships, and each was unique and impermanent. One of Chairman Mao's most ambitious goals was to erase the importance of these particularistic relationships and replace them with a principle of absolute loyalty to the party. Mao outlawed lineage loyalties and ancestor worship and attempted to break down the basic family unit. Interpersonal relationships between subjects were no longer supposed to con constitute the nexus of Chinese sociality. Instead, under Maoism, only loyalty to the party and a commitment to serve the people were important. The people became both the party state's servants and the objects of service. To serve the people was to serve the party, and to serve the party was to serve the common good. In this vein, party officials frequently mobilized what Mao termed the masses. Mobilizing the masses meant mobilizing the people to act as a single unified force. 
Many of Mao's mass campaigns depended on the brute force of millions of people working tirelessly together to serve the common good. And this brings us back to public health. During the height of Maoism, China reported astonishing public health successes, resulting in vastly improved health indicators, which you can see here. Outside observers attributed these successes to mass mobilization movements like Mao's patriotic health campaigns. Some of these campaigns were quite memorable and dramatic. For example, thousands of peasants being organized to pick up vermin one by one and clean parasite infested ponds by hand. Barefoot doctors vaccinated rural populations, and Mao also established anti-epidemic stations throughout the country to orchestrate the mass campaign. This public health effort was hailed internationally as a model for the World Health Organization's primary health care movement, and Mao for a time became the darling of the international health community. In a way, Mao was an early proponent of what we now think of as a form of glo activist global health. He saw the improvement of the poor health of China's masses as a strike against global capitalist oppression. His movement promoted messages of service and community empowerment on a grand scale. Public health workers' jobs were to serve the people and thus the common good by raising the people's consciousness and mobilizing them to serve themselves. After the Chinese government launched this dramatic campaign in 2003 to control SARS, international observers praised this effort as a positive vestige of Maoist mass mobilizations arguing that government-led mass campaigns could be important tools for stemming emerging infectious diseases. Some of the post-SARS rhetoric from the central government also urged a renewed role for mass mobilizations. The public health professionals I knew, though, insisted that the idea that mass mobilizations could continue to drive public health work in China in the 21st century was based on false assumptions. One, that the masses were still mobilizable, and two, that a party-led vision of the state could still represent the common good. Neither of these assumptions felt true to 21st century public health workers. Also, on a more pragmatic level, at the time that SARS hit, the public health system wasn't really designed to be running mass mobilizations anymore. After Mao died in 1976, public health infrastructure had fallen apart over the following 25 years, until the central government finally began rebuilding the public health system in the early 2000s, just prior to the, to the arrival of SARS but they did so with a very different idea about how the masses fit into public health. The government replaced the anti-epidemic stations that formed the backbone of Mao's mass campaigns with thousands of Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDCs. Rather than doing sanitation or vaccination, the CDCs were to focus on disease surveillance and scientific research. The name CDC, an explicit reference to the US CDC in Atlanta, was intended to evoke a highly modern scientific ethos. The masses were now seen as a public health problem, and scientific experts were the solution. Until SARS hit, though, the call to build the CDC system remained an, un remained an unfunded and unclear mandate. The arrival of SARS made this mandate crystal clear. The new CDCs would not mobilize local communities to resist the global capitalist system. Instead, they would do science in order to make sure that they would be able to maintain this system in the face of destabilizing global disease threats posed by local populations. The common good that public health workers were to serve changed dramatically. Local public health, especially in large urban centers, began focusing on serving global rather than local interests and on serving the middle class that felt threatened by a rural poor that they saw as invading their cities with unsanitary and backward habits capable of harboring and spreading infectious diseases like SARS. Over the next several years, hundreds of young scientists with master's degrees and PhDs were hired to carry out the new CDC mission. Having lost their taste for service to the common good as defined by Mao and feeling stifled by the family and grouchy based social structures that have replaced communist ideals, these young educated people looked outside of the party state and outside of their own neighborhoods for a new sense of community. In particular, they looked to the global scientific community that was now suddenly very interested in working with them closely in what felt like an important common cause, the prevention of the next infectious pandemic. But the Western partners that my interlocutors were working with for the most part viewed the community of their Chinese partners quite differently. For them, all of China, educated professional and poor migrant alike, constituted a single national community in contrast to the West, and Chinese public health professionals functioned as representatives of that community. This had two implications. One was that my interlocutors were grouped together with the same migrants they were trying to set themselves apart from. The other was that working 
was that working with Chinese professionals and respecting their ways of doing things became a proxy for what Western collaborators saw as empowerment of China to represent its own interests in a global setting. The assumption here was that Chinese public health professionals and the marginalized bodies they were managing shared a set of common interests and concerns, and that they were all concerned with the Chinese common good. The result of all of this for Tian Mai's rural to urban migrant workers was, I will suggest, not very good. Now excluded from public health workers' ideas of the common good, sick members of the floating population became relevant mostly as a threat to be controlled, or in some cases, a resource to be extracted. So, so far I've been speaking pretty abstractly, but I want to turn now to some ethnographic vignettes from my fieldwork to illustrate some ways in which this all played out in the context of Tian Mai. So vignette one. When I first met Sudan, an epidemiologist at the Tian Mai CDC, she had just begun work on a massive study of thousands of migrant workers, looking at the prevalence of certain diseases in collaboration with an Australian professor whom I call Professor Smith. Sue explained to me that her goal was to understand the biology of the floating population. We have no idea what they're eating, what diseases they're carrying, what is in their blood, and that is very scary. By framing her project as part of a government-sponsored initiative to improve migrant health, she would be able to gather an enormous amount of data that she suspected would be of substantial interest to the international community. Professor Smith, who had no hope of getting access to thousands of Chinese migrants herself, was delighted to offer support and funding for the project. Armed with the academic and financial support of a prestigious foreign university, Xu and her colleagues were easily able to convince the City Bureau of Health that this project should be done as part of an official migrant health campaign. Xu secured access to migrants laboring at, laboring at dozens of factories throughout the city. The factory bosses were asked to round up 60 workers per factory. Comprehensive medical histories, as well as the blood of the workers, were collected and analyzed. For two weeks, I accompanied Xu, as well as another epidemiologist I call Dr. Bo, and a small army of research assistants and nurses as they trained small group leaders in the factories to administer the surveys and as they carried out the blood draws. The migrants were told that the blood draw was a health checkup service that they would receive for free. When I went with Dr. Bo to pick up the surveys a week later, however, we found that many of the migrants had failed to fill out parts of the survey or, they signed their or to sign their names on the informed consent line. Bo scolded the small group leaders, who quickly filled in the missing parts, even signing the migrants' names for them if they neglected to do so. So let's put this in a little bit of context. The preponderance of disease problems from which Tian Mai's migrant population suffered made the floating population a public health danger, but also an especially productive resource from the standpoint of foreign researchers. One foreign researcher, for example, told me that she liked working in China because she was rarely privileged to see so many unusual disorders in one place. Beyond asking them to fill out consent forms and get approval from local IRBs, however, my informant's foreign collaborators tended to avoid getting involved with how their Chinese colleagues accessed the bodies they needed. So for example, in this case, Xu's research partner made the convenient assumption that Xu and Dr. Bo were looking out for the common good, and therefore that their interests and the interests of the people they were managing were aligned. In fact, by deferring to her Chinese colleagues, Professor Smith saw herself as participating in a kind of local Chinese empowerment. In an interview, Professor Smith told me, quote, I get all my information from Xu. She knows everything. She's very savvy. I don't know about her methods. People do things differently over there. They have their way of doing things, and I try not to get involved. I have no business telling them to do it another way. In the future, we'll all be doing it China's way anyway. Professor Smith justified her lack of interest in the procedures by which her, her Chinese colleagues interacted with local populations with a mixture of cultural relativism, cultural essentialism, and talk of an impending Chinese imperialism. In the meantime, she was able to access data that she would likely never be able to access on her own. Of course, the quality of that data was quite questionable, making it unlikely it would ever actually end up helping the populations from which it was extracted. So when I tell this story to students in my global health classes, it often sounds to them like yet another story of poor people in a developing country being exploited in the name of scientific research. And when I tell it to my colleagues in public health, it sounds to them like just a really poor quality epidemiological study. But I want to suggest that the Great Migrant Study also has something somewhat more subtle to tell us about the common good. Tian Mai's public health professionals weren't just conduits through which migrant bodies were converted into what Sundar Rajan calls biocapital. They were also actively making use of local populations in service of a perceived common good, 
They wanted to get ahead with their careers, of course, but they also spoke of their moral obligation to produce data for foreign partners who had entrusted them with this important task. When faced with uncooperative subjects, they had no choice but to help them participate anyway, because this is what they had promised they would do, and it was what both science and public health safety required. In Sue's view, it was well worth the sacrifice of the autonomy of some migrant workers for the good of contributing to scientific knowledge and knowing what was, as she put it, in the floating population's blood. Whether the data collected accurately reflected what the migrants were experiencing was not as important as you might think either, because this exercise was never about serving migrant communities. It was about gathering information that they felt the scientific community would desire. Sue told me she was embarrassed about the quality of the data, but that the best path forward was to carry on with it anyway, in the hopes that she might contribute a needed Chinese perspective to global health research, and eventually earn her way into a position abroad where she could, quote, make a difference in a place where people really care and they have the means and skills to actually make people's lives better. In other words, she would have a better chance of contributing to some sort of common good if she didn't get hung up on contributing to a local good. Her foreign colleagues in turn operated under the assumption that Chinese public health professionals abided by a set of interests and values that were alien from themselves and yet widely shared with the broader Chinese population. In other words, Xu's foreign collaborators conveniently assumed that their Chinese partners were looking out for the common good of Chinese populations, that the object of service and of governance was one and the same. Smith told me that this study would surely benefit migrant workers by producing knowledge that would help them be healthier. But as Chinese themselves, her Chinese partners were tasked with making sure this actually happened. The resulting division of ethical labor established the burden for considering the needs of local populations as lying only with a set of local professionals who were a little more invested in that population's well-being than their foreign partners were. So I want to tell one more story, and then I'll try to pull all the strands of the talk together. Vignette two. Unlike SARS, the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic began in North America, with the first cases recorded in California and Mexico. When H1N1 appeared many weeks later in Hong Kong, the first priority of the local public health system in Chiang Mai was to prevent the virus from crossing into mainland China. The Chiang Mai Quarantine Bureau reassigned much of its personnel to man flu prevention booths on the border, where they examined health reports and pointed laser thermometers shaped like guns at the foreheads of anyone coming from an epidemic region. And if you traveled around there at this time, you probably encountered this creepy device. Anyone showing a fever of at least 37.5 degrees Celsius or any other flu-like symptoms would be evaluated by CDC workers and likely isolated until H1N1 was ruled out. In addition, anyone reporting contact with a flu patient or seated near one on an airplane was detained in a quarantine facility. Most TMI CDC members were pulled from their positions in other departments and assigned to carry out these tasks, putting all other programs, including surveillance for more common infectious diseases, on hold. At the beginning of the campaign, a wave of excitement rushed through the Tianmai CDC. Eager young workers who had spent their entire short careers training for a moment like this volunteered to take up residence in the quarantine camp. Quarantine notices were issued with a sense of importance, and foreign travelers were calmed with appeals to a moral high ground, based in, as was explained to me, quote, the laws of our country and of the international community, internationally accepted regulations, and a responsibility to society and the world. There's a feeling of pride that the people there were carrying out a rigorous response worthy of the CDC name. But within a couple of weeks, the tone soured. As you'll recall, during the SARS epidemic, China's public health professionals were internationally praised for implementing harsh but apparently successful control measures. But when they began to institute similar measures in response to H1N1, this time focusing on foreign travelers in an effort to contain the virus outside rather than inside China's borders, the same organizations that had praised China six years earlier instead either kept quiet or called the response an overreaction. And Western news outlets published harrowing accounts of their citizens' quarantine experiences at the hands of a draconian state. The efforts that Tian Mai's public health professionals thought would solidify their place in a global scientific community instead seemed to be jeopardizing it. A bureaucracy had been built for this purpose, people had been trained, money had been invested, infrastructure had been built, and over and over again, they had been told that they were responsible for taming the next pandemic. But now that they are doing exactly what they thought they were supposed to be doing, they are being criticized rather than praised. Meanwhile, their American colleagues seemed to them to be standing by and doing nothing, allowing the disease to invade China. To many, this felt like a betrayal. One epidemiologist told me, quote, the international community should support us 
It's the U.S. they should criticize. They are the ones who did not do anything to stop this. The U.S. CDC and WHO officials with whom I spoke considered the Chinese control measures to be an overreaction, but at the same time, they seemed unsurprised that their Chinese colleagues had undertaken these actions, given what they referred to as the, quote, local values in China. They also pointed out that such measures would most likely never be attempted in the present-day U.S., despite the fact that H1N1 had first started spreading in the U.S., and that six years earlier during SARS, American officials had celebrated China's actions as appropriate when they were directed toward China's own people. I asked a US CDC worker in Beijing how high he thought the bar would have to be for the US to undertake something along the lines of what he had witnessed in China. At the time, and this was in 2009, you'll recall, he joked it would have to be something more along the lines of an Ebola outbreak. He said, quote, yeah, I think there would have to be like blood coming out of your eyes. Of course, this was five years before the Ebola epidemic of 2014 when the state of New Jersey did briefly implement a controversial border quarantine policy, which immediately met with legal challenges. My 2009 interviewee went on to describe a speech in which a colleague had told his Chinese counterparts, quote, you know, quarantine is about risks that a society is willing to take. It's an intervention that's partly determined by your cultural values. An ethical guidance issued by WHO in 2007 supported this stance, suggesting that though all measures that restrict liberties should be implemented only when, quote, strictly necessary in a democratic society, latitude in terms of, speci in terms of specific approaches will depend on, quote, local circumstances and community values. Gaston and colleagues argued further that China's successful SARS containment effort reflected the fact that, quote, coercive strategies reflect conceptions of individual rights the legitimacy of state intrusions, and the appropriate balance between security and liberty. Measures tolerable in an authoritarian regime would not be tolerated in a liberal democratic state. He and others concluded that as members of an authoritarian society, Chinese people would naturally find it more acceptable to be subject to coercive practices than people of democratic societies. By leaving to the judgment of Chinese public health officials which measures were acceptable and which were not, they saw themselves as empowering the Chinese community to make its own decisions. The problem is that this approach fails to acknowledge the existence of a multiplicity of communities in China, or to consider what might happen if Chinese public health officials began restricting the civil liberties of non-Chinese, as happened with H1N1. In the early days of the H1N1 response, my interlocutors argued that their foreign partners' assumptions about Chinese society and what it would tolerate for the common good were valid. A young epidemiologist told me that China was able to respond more effectively to outbreaks because of Chinese people's greater sense of responsibility to the collective. She said, quote, Chinese people are very compliant like that. You say you need to be quarantined, we need to take your blood, and they listen to you. They won't go complaining about their individual issues. Americans think this is about my life, and my life is very precious, whereas Chinese, we think about the group. Once again, though, we have to ask what is meant here by the group. In this context, my informant seemed to be joining her foreign colleagues in defining the relevant group as the Chinese nation. But on closer examination, it became clear that she did not really include herself in the group expected to make individual sacrifices. This same interlocutor later admitted to lying about her own contact with sick patients when she crossed the border between Hong Kong and mainland China because she, quote, did not want to spend a week in that unpleasant quarantine hospital. In other words, individual sacrifice is something others had the responsibility to make. In fact, most of the Chinese public health professionals I talked to seem no more willing than the average American to sacrifice themselves for the good of the collective. Talk of a single essential Chinese collectivist ethic makes little sense in a city as heterogeneous as Chiang Mai, let alone all of China, and threatens to provide an excuse for demanding sacrifices from some communities that would not be acceptable in others. And here's where we come back to the floating population. When asked to point to what populations within China were most likely to spread a pandemic, Chinese public health professionals invariably pointed again to the floating population. H1M1 never actually spread widely among migrants in Tian Mai. While my informants acknowledge that if the virus had spread among the floating population and the epidemic proportions feared, mass quarantines in migrant areas would almost certainly have been implemented. And quarantine conditions would likely have been quite different from the rather comfortable conditions provided for foreign travelers. Also, H1N1 ended up being a mild virus should a truly catastrophic flu pandemic reach Tian Mai, the floating migrants might well rapidly spread the virus, just as my informants feared. At the same time, they likely would be the first to suffer and the last to receive care. <laughs>
So to sum up, I suggest that these slippages that my interlocutors and their foreign collaborators were engaging in with regards to the concept of the common good in the community highlight the need to interrogate more closely what people mean when they purport to be helping or serving a group. We need to consider how these concepts come to be multiple and how that multiplicity may enable a form of buck passing that establishes the care and protection of certain populations is always someone else's problem. All of this raises a larger and broader question of who the common and the common good is in really any circumstance in which one is acting on behalf of a large number of people at once. So to close, I want to consider a case that many of us Americans are thinking a lot about right now, making America great again. Oh, don't worry, I promise you this isn't turning into a lecture about Donald Trump. <coughs> But I wouldn't be alone in suggesting that one reason for the vast disconnect between those who think that President Trump's vision will make America great again and those who think it will make America much, much worse is a difference in people's definitions of America and who is included in the term the American people, and thus who is included in the American common good. People's ideas of what the American people includes, who should have to sacrifice to serve the common good, and of course, what would be considered good in the first place, all diverge wildly. The boundaries of an aggregate like the American people are very difficult to define precisely due to the purposeful ambiguity of the term. This is a problem that Americans have become painfully aware of in the past couple of years, and yet it really mirrors the problems, the same problem that lurks beneath the work of public health and global health. Everyone has a different idea of what this common good might be, and while the desired good part may be stated, the makeup of the common is usually left unstated, leading to people talking past each other quite a lot. It's often purposefully unstated. Even today, not that many people want to admit that anyone is being left out. And yet my research suggests that this slipperiness that we all engage in when it comes to talking about what we really mean by the common good and who we're really trying to help and who would be expected to sacrifice can lead to a lot of problems even when everyone involved has the very best of intentions, which of course sometimes they do not. So I'm gonna leave it there and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. One of the themes that, that was running through your talk was this issue of cultural stereotypes, mm -hmm. and um, both cultural stereotypes that we hold about ourselves as well as other groups, mm -hmm. right? And I think the two are um, connected, because one of the things, uh, especially with regards to your uh, current project on perinatal, I guess, experiences, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis nowadays on cultural competency in healthcare, but a lot of these cultural competency guidelines are actually really racist, uh -huh. right? Um, and so I guess my question that I'm sort of reaching for here is, you know, um, to what extent um, are you interested in questions of how these cultural stereotypes actually define the scope of what people are able to do. Because for example, I'm not convinced that rhetoric about the common good is maybe as evocative in the American setting as it might be in the Chinese setting. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, in, in what ways do does that keep create these blind spots where people don't actually realize what it is they're doing because they think that they're serving this cultural stereotype of themselves that maybe they're not, so. Yeah, that's a great question, and I, I'm not sure if I can answer it completely, but I, I think that is one of the issues I'm getting at, that there is a sort of comfort in cultural competency. Um, I don't want to disparage it entirely, because I think it's a move in the right direction in a lot of cases, rather than ignoring the fact that people are different, right? But I think people often use it as an excuse for um, not thinking about people as sort of individual people, and sort of, well, you're Chinese, so you're probably worry about the group and you probably have filial piety and this and that, right? And then, and then does lead to that stereotyping, especially in the clinical setting and cultural competency in clinical settings has gotten a lot of criticism for this that, you know, you get these trainings, well, Latino people are like this and African Americans are like that. And then you see this patient and you just group them into this stereotyped group, which is of course not very helpful. Um, and I think that people sometimes kind of own those stereotypes, especially a, a lot of Chinese people own those stereotypes, which they don't actually practice or believe in reality, but you know, like to talk about collectivism and this kind of thing. Um, so it's a tough problem, but I think what I'm trying to highlight in my talk is that 
there's a lot of buck passing and a lot of what I was calling an ethical division of labor, right? Well, I don't really understand your society and you have kind of different values, so you deal with that. Um, and, and taking these sort of elites as representative of a country of 1.3 billion people, when they might not necessarily have the interests of those people in mind any more than anybody else does, um, because of some sort of cultural difference that someone's um, identifying. So I think it's a very dangerous territory. Um, and I'm not sure I'm ready to say that we shouldn't have cultural competency training, but I think you point at something that really bothers me about it, for sure. Yeah. Um, so what were they referring to in terms of that? Were they talking about like from birth disorders? Uh, was it like physical? Was it like long-term diseases? Like what kind of things were they even looking for? Okay, yeah. So that sense? particular conversation I didn't get into in my talk, but um, yeah. they're actually talking about workers who were exposed to a lot of toxins. Mm. Um, so part of the study uh, was looking at uh, level of toxin levels in the migrant workers' blood to see uh, kind of how bad it was. And again, there is this disconnect with between actually doing something about that and the sort of scientific interest. Um, and so I was talking with a professor who was doing a study with them um, who was saying, you know, this is great because these workers have all sorts of crazy levels of these different heavy metals that, you know, yeah. you would not see in the U.S. And it's very interesting from an intellectual standpoint. Yeah. Again, not to demonize that person because I think they meant well, but um, there is that tension that then occurs. Mm -hmm. well, was there ever any like follow up? Like, did they actually go back to any of the migrants? Like, was there any like what was the effect of the research? I guess. Um, it wasn't really planned as an intervention study, yeah. so you know I didn't follow it all the way through. But yeah. it was it was a basic research study, so I'm not sure yeah. what they did with it, if anything. Yeah. To be honest with you. Right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about the ethos of individual sacrifice mm -hmm. and also how that might have changed from the Maoist period to the post-78 and reform period and if the concept of sacrifice has sort of undergone any transformation. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, you know, I'm not a historian, so I'm not sure I can answer that completely, but there's certainly an element during the Mao period where you know, the individual didn't matter at all, right? It was, it was all for, and, and your family also wasn't supposed to matter, although of course it still did, um, because it was all towards this kind of collective good. And I think that that element of sacrifice is still, I mean, speaking to the other question, very much a part of the way people talk about themselves as Chinese, and yet it's, it's not reflective of how most people kind of act these days, um, which is not to condemn anybody, because I don't think Americans are very self-sacrificing either. Um, but, you know, I think there is this deep disconnect between kind of how people view themselves and how they actually behave. And I saw very little evidence of people's willingness to sacrifice themselves for really anyone except perhaps their family um, in these kinds of situations. But there is, there is still, I think what's carried over from that period is that discourse that, you know, we sacrifice ourselves for the common good and for the collective and for the group. and. Um, that the way people talk about it has not really caught up with how people actually behave. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. That was so clear. And I felt like I was there with you for your field work. And that doesn't often happen in talks. So thank you. That was wonderful. Um, one, uh, this may not have been part of the scope of what you did. But in some ways, what you're talking about is how everybody sees their own social world as finely grained and then other people's social worlds as categorically lumped mm -hmm. so that people have this tendency to model you know have a figure in mind that they use to imagine a whole group of people and in your talk you have lots of the scientists modeling each other and modeling populations and i'm wondering you know what this stuff looks like in the floating population like how is science imagined how is you know what is the quarantine process you know how do people 
describe what's happening in that process and how do they model the state versus public health and is there a differentiation there and how are doctors involved? I'm sort of wondering about all the imaginaries from the, the what, what shows up in your talk as just sort of the objects of concern. Yeah. Sure, so I mean there's a reason that they show up just as the objects which is that uh, practically, and you know this as an anthropologist, as if you're kind of part of the the state, right, and if you're embedded with those folks, it's very, very hard to talk to the people who they're then acting upon and have them actually trust you. So I actually did try to do some interviews with, um, with migrant workers and did not get very far, um, except that I was able to establish that they had no idea what, so, you know, I, I described the migrant clinics, and so I went along to, they had these sort of traveling clinics where they would go to, like, the karaoke bar or wherever and do the, um, you know, take the samples and kind of do all the procedures there. And they set me up with some, you know, to talk to some workers. And I, I was able to determine that they had no idea what they were being tested for, nor did they have any expectation that anybody was going to help them based on, you know, what might be found. Um, but I wasn't able to get very far in terms of their perspective on things. Um, what I will say is that in terms of the general population, the, the public health people so you know, this gets into kind of state bureaucracy in China, but the, the people in the CDCs were technically not part of the state. So they were, a, um, I'm, now, I'm now forgetting the exact term, but they, they were a technical institution that was affiliated with the state. So they would get kind of directives from the Bureau of Health, which was part of the state, and then they were supposed to be carrying them out and kind of doing these scientific projects. But that, that you know, differentiation was totally lost on the general population. I mean, they were very much seen as, as part of the state and, and as part of kind of this monolithic group of kind of corrupt bureaucrats, um, even though they very much did not want to see themselves that way. They wanted to see themselves as these professional scientists who were doing this good scientific research. And most people kind of saw them as more people trying to kind of, you know, uh, take things from them and, um, drinking away all of the you know, public money and that kind of thing. Um, but in terms of the perspectives of the floating population, I can't really speak to that. Yeah. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. So I sort of have a two part question. Um, the first is thinking about um, the biopolitical and your thoughts, if you have them, on how your example might disrupt that a little bit because I find that often the tension is one between the individual and collective which also mirrors the tension more generally in public health yeah and there seems to be something a little bit more interesting there with the moving target within the collective um, yeah. so just thoughts about how that might disrupt that tension between sort of the individual and the anim anatomy of politics and politics and the, um, the, pop the greater population and then the second part um, is thinking through with um, knowing that you have also described the floating population as um, what non-biological citizens, I think is yeah, yeah. the phrase that you use. Is there an isomorphism there with biological non-citizens and the com who was the common good? Are those always the same? Is there? I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah, so um, I'll try to answer the first one first. So yeah, I mean, I think you are pointing to something that I'm really interested in, and I've kind of extended that to thinking about my um, U.S. research as well, which is, well, there are two sides to that biopolitics question. One is kind of breaking down the monolith of, you know, the state, right? I, I'm really interested in who is the state, like who are these people who are, which I think, you know, in anthropology is still, even though people do study the state, is still very often, especially among medical anthropologists, seen as this sort of bad, you know, evil controlling disciplinary body and not really looking seriously at what people's motivations are and what their moral worlds are like um, and trying to kind of look at it uh, a little bit more generously um, without, you know, thinking of assuming that those people are good people. And I want to emphasize that even though, I, you know, my work sometimes comes across as making these people look really bad, but I, I, I actually, I was friends with these people and they were really nice and they really did mean well. Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to get at is if you're nice and you mean well and yet it, it looks like you're doing things that seem to us to be kind of unethical, then what is it that you are trying to do, right? Assuming that you're actually an ethical person who is, does have some sort of ethical framework 
for what your, your purpose is and that you're not just trying to make money or whatever, um, then what is it that you're actually trying to do? And that's really something I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and the other aspect of that is, is looking at that relationship between population and individual, um, which I think you know, we, we kind of also gloss over a little bit that, oh, it, there's you know, biopolitical control at the level of the population and the level of the individual, and it's all encompassing, and not really thinking about how those two things connect. And so one of the things I've gotten really interested in is how people who work in population health, both in China and also here, how they conceive of that population and kind of anthropomorphize it and how they envision who that person is, who that individual person is that's sort of represented by the population. And this also gets to the sort of cultural competency question of it becomes this sort of um, ideal type of this kind of person that you're picturing helping or doing something about. Um, and so you are actually picturing individuals, it's just they're not real individuals. And so that relationship between the, they're kind of imagined individuals. Um, and so that relationship between population and individual, I think also needs to be deconstructed a lot more and hasn't been thought about enough. Um, and your second question, I'm now forgetting, I'm sorry. Um, the bias for bias. Oh yeah, and the relationship to the common good. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that, so what I was trying to do in the article when I, that I wrote about biological non-citizens um, was thinking about that citizen, uh, citizenship aspect particularly, right? The access to resources and the sort of um, reasoning people gave, right? For why people should not be able to access resources or why they didn't deserve to access resources. And the common good, I think, is a little bit broader than that. It doesn't just have to do with accessing resources specifically, but has to do with kind of who is included in our kind of collective uh, being almost, like who, who are we as a group of people, um, which is I think also a little bit more abstract than, than the sort of materialistic aspect of citizenship. Does that make sense? Yeah, no. yeah. yeah thanks for asking that. That's a good question. So um, going back to you know the question of who is America, um, without getting political, I think that when that question is asked, one of the things that immediately comes to the table is is race, right? How does race play into and, and national origin play into what it means to be American? And um, you know, in your in your talk, uh, talking about how the public health workers talked about the migrant population, you know, I'm sort of searching for a word that would describe in China what race describes in the United States, mm -hmm. right? And I'm thinking like Emily, Emily Honig's uh, work on the um, cotton mill workers in Shanghai, right? Mm -hmm. The Subway people are dirty, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, it's kind of like this internalized other within a perceived racial group that um, the discrimination is every bit as strong and these people are every bit as marked in an imagined way, mm -hmm. right, as, as constructed racial groups are in the United States. And so I'm kind of wondering, you know, how would you talk about the way in which these perceptions of the dirty other who's coming in to take our jobs and our, you know, is, is affecting uh, that question of who has the right to be part of the public that's being served? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I actually um, wrote an article about something very, along those lines that has to do with race in China, which I think is also an under-researched kind of issue. I think they're very much racialized. I mean, that's the short answer. I think that, um, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head with that in that, uh, you know, there are the ethnic minority others, right? Like the Tibetans and the Uyghurs and all of that, but um, the most prevalent other that's sort of like invading our space. I mean, the ethnic others are still, for most people in the big city, is kind of this abstract thing. You might come across them sometimes, but it's not, doesn't feel that threatening, except maybe like the Uyghurs when you're afraid of terrorism or something. But in the, the sort of immediate other that's in your space, that's dirty, that's not deserving, that's you know lower than you, and, and physically often darker um, because of having worked in the sun and all of that. Um, I think they're very much racialized, and I think we could call it a racial issue, actually, um, because people look at them physically and are able to identify them. So there's a lot of racial profiling that happens in the big cities. Um, people will be stopped if they look like a migrant worker, and there was a period when I was doing my research, when I did some follow-up research, and I think it was in 2014, when they were sort of cracking down a little bit, 
on people who were not supposed to be there and didn't even have sort of a temporary resident permit or anything. And I mean, very much like here, people were being stopped on the subway because they looked like a migrant worker. What does it mean to look like a migrant worker? They're short, they're dark, they look dirty, right? I mean, I, I think it's very much racialized. Um, I mean, it's, people wouldn't say that because they're Han Chinese and therefore they're supposed to be the same race, but I think it functions in a really similar way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, thank you for your emphasis on the public health in China. And you know, um, there are large areas of rural areas in China, and there, are, mm, they, uh, the people there are very hard to access the perhaps the basic medical care. Mm -hmm. And I think um, uh, I I wonder uh, whether you have some advice to um, how to provide uh, this kind of people uh, the the basic medical care, um, uh, do, uh, do you think the, uh, the barefoot um, doctors and uh, during uh, Chairman Mao's period is, is, is a useful me measure, but they are not, uh, qual uh, they are not qualified doctors. Um, perhaps they, they can do something good for, for their people, for, for the people there, but they will uh, produce um, a lot of uh, problems at the same time, I think. Um, so, <laughs> uh, what's your advice to uh, provide some uh, the, the the basic medical care to such kind of people? Thank you. Well, I'm not a, a policymaker, so I'm not sure I have good advice. But um, I mean, I think you point to a big controversy about uh, barefoot doctors that's worth thinking about more, right? About to what extent did they actually do some good? And I mean, I think so, you know, I showed a bunch of statistics that suggest that a lot of really big health gains were made during that period. And you know, some of the people I talked to were pretty suspicious of those statistics. I think we always have to be suspicious of statistics. Um, but I think most people agree that there were some really big gains made in rural areas during that time. Um, whether that's the answer now, because it's true that they were not very qualified and sometimes did more harm than good, right? Um, so I think that's a really tough question. And I also think it's something that wouldn't, probably wouldn't work today um, for some of the reasons that I was talking about, about people's kind of conception of their responsibility or of mobilizing the masses and that kind of thing. Um, I think it would be really tough. And so I don't really have a good answer to what should be done, um, but I think it would have to be something quite different than what happened back during the Mao period. Because I just, everyone I talked to in public health said, you know, that stuff just wouldn't work today. Because even if, even in terms of, of vaccinating people, right? I talked to this woman who was the head of the vaccination department um, in, in one of the uh, institutions I was working with. And she said, you know, back in the day when I was a kid, you would round up the whole village and you'd go and vaccinate everybody said, now you can't even round up the whole village. You don't know where they are, right? Most of them are in the cities or they, they're not willing, they're suspicious. You want to vaccinate them, they're going to be like, why are you trying to vaccinate me? I'm not sick. Like, you know, the, there'd be resistance to it. There, and so again, this gets back to, there's this vision that, oh, Chinese are really compliant. They just will do whatever you say. And that's not actually really true in all settings, right? So I think that there has to be a, a different kind of solution, um, but I don't know what that is, I'm sorry. Um, um, thank you again like for your insights in the um, public health in China. And then like, uh, like here in the States, like, um, Big like pharmaceuticals like um, industry and also like the insurance company like he has like a lot of influence in the um, public health or like um, mm -hmm. like in general. But then like like how do you think like it's similar or like it's different like in China or like in like other um, area? In terms of the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, like how like how much like influence or like how does it like kind of like um, promote like all to develop the public health in, in China, I would say. A, a pharmaceutical company in particular. That's a great question that I don't know that I know the answer to. Um, I mean, I think that there's a lot more government control of these things than there are in the States. Um, so my instinct would be not as influential, but I, I, I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't know much about the current pharmaceutical industry. I mean, my only, my only kind of reference point for that is 
um, that I did talk with some of the people in the local FDA. So much like the CDCs, there are like all of these thousands of local FDAs at the local level. Um, and there is a similar tension there that I describe in the CDC system where um, they were um, not so interested in making public like the bad side or side effects of drugs, right? Um, so, you know, they would collect all this data and I actually had this really strange experience where one of the FDA people brought over this beautiful glossy booklet with all these pie charts of like, um, you know, side effects of these various medications that were out on the market and, and deaths and everything else. And he said, you can't take any of this with you because this is not public information. And I said, well, shouldn't, I mean, shouldn't it be public information so people know what's safe and what isn't? Um, because there's a lot of paranoia about medications, right? There are a lot of fake drugs and things like that. Um, and, um, you know, a similar argument was made about we don't want to scare people, we don't want to cause a panic. Um, and so in that sense, you know, there's a lot of corruption involved in terms of cracking down on, um, on pharmaceutical companies and food companies and things like that and making sure that they abide by regulations. So um, that's a whole other can of worms. Um, but I, I, I think that the influence comes in a little bit of a different way maybe than in the U.S. Hi, I just wondered what the modern, you know, internet, cell phones, and all of that, what kind of influence it has, if it has influenced it, where you talk about Milo and all the rest where it wasn't there, but now that that's there, what kind of information do people get and out in the villages and the rest? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that there's a lot more of a rumor mill. I mean, there's always been a rumor mill in China, but, um, you know, people, like, there are a lot of um, kind of spam text messages that you get that are saying, you know, with some sort of conspiracy about this, you know, this drug, for example, don't give it to your child or don't give them this formula because it's contaminated or this many people died in this area because of that. Um, so, I, I mean, I, and, you know, people in rural areas have cell phones and are certainly hooked up to all of that. So I think that and that's a whole other project, which you know I have not done. But I think that the the um, effect of that is huge. I mean, certainly, when I was there with the H1N1 epidemic, people were constantly circulating all sorts of conspiracy theories and um, paranoid fantasies about what was actually happening. And there are thousands of people quarantined in this place. And um, and so you know, how much of that is true, I have no idea. But I think it I think it serves a similar role that it serves here in that people have access to a lot of information, but the quality of that information is usually not very good and it's really hard to parse out what's real and what's not and what's fake news or whatever. So um, that's a whole other project. <laughs> that's an interesting question. Do they have their Fox News program? No. <laughs> No, they don't, um, because they're still state-controlled TV. Um, so I guess that would be a big difference. The TV is not where people are getting their, their information. Mm -hmm. I think we have a few um, questions. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. I'm sure thank, you. thank you. Thank you.